My name is Nancy Burkhalter. I'm a grateful member of Al Anon. I'm going to list of those people because John claims I don't have any friends. <laughs> because of a loving God and the steps of this program, I stopped doing drive by Al Anon in May of 1986. <laughs> Now, Dana claims that she thought of that expression first. Obviously, she doesn't know the rule. Once you've used it three times, it's yours, baby. No. And also, Russell, I, I need to add to the list. If you've ever taken a hostage, please stand. Okay, my people... Excuse me, I gotta talk to Richard a second. Now, are you starting now with that clock, or did you start when they started reading? I'm not gonna pay any attention to it. I'm just asking the question. Okay, okay good luck with that. Um, I always do this, though, so people can see that I'm taking my watch off. Hey, I'm a college professor. Time means nothing to me, you know? And I can multitask. Just I'm not done. You show people, come on up, and I'll just be the center of your show. I mean, I re thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't thank you enough. And I really mean that. I'm not one of those people who came in grateful. <laughs> um, in fact, you know, I have a little schnauzer. Thank you. Really, my people. Anyway. I have a little schnauzer, uh, and if you, of course, maybe every dog does this, but she'll kind of go. And I did that for about the first four years of my recovery. When you asked me to be of service, I'd be like, you really? You know, uh, anybody else say, um, I don't drink coffee, if they wanted you to. Okay, some of you don't remember the actual coffee cup. I didn't think so. Um... We used to wash the cups, or they'd say, you need to clean those. Just go grab, gather up the ashtrays, and I'd go, don't smoke. What I was really thinking on the inside was, you know, if this is an organization that can't afford cleaning service, <laughs> perhaps you should rethink. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? I'm going to tell you a lot about what I brought to you that was so delightful. Oh, I have to mention John two more times. He asked me to mention him in the CD three times. Um, let's see. Something not... John, John, John. <laughs> I'm just... Yeah. And, well, really, I did know him in Austin uh, when we both came into the program uh, before he got, you know, run out of town. So... I, uh, so, anyway, what a delight. It's been, uh, I've had many friends here that I've known before, and I hope you were at, John, uh, at John's talk. You know, you missed something if you weren't. This is a family disease, and it's ugly. It's ugly. But there's a solution, and the solution's in here. Uh, I have a good friend. I uh, I'm going to really panic you. I'm a pray and go girl. So we don't have any idea what we're going to talk about. Neither one of us. Okay. So, You know, I, uh, this is a fact, you know, that for every alcoholic, there's 10 to 15 people significantly affected by their alcoholism. So when you think about it, this room should be two or three times larger than it is. But it's really difficult to walk in and surrender to a program when you're perfect. Yeah. It's hard. And, uh, and but I, I will, if you're new, I can give you some hope. There's some new people you can tell the drama to. You know, if you go into Al Anon for the first time, they'll listen, you know, for the 30 seconds or more. About Because what I was reminded of in a workshop this morning is I came to Al-Anon because of somebody else's drinking and behavior. That's the truth. But I'm in Al-Anon today because of my behavior. I said in, in that workshop, I said, you know, I wouldn't even need Al-Anon anymore after 26 years if I never left my bed, you know, in the morning. If I just stayed there all the time, I wouldn't really need you. But today, I need you more than possibly I ever have. 
because I enjoy the life that I have today. I absolutely enjoy it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Oh, by the way, this, this airport thing, you know, usually when you have an al going to pick you up, they come in the same day. Okay. No. Um, but you send an alcoholic, and I got to tell you, it could be days before they remembered that that's their commitment. So, um, yeah, I've had both situations. And, uh, but no, I wanted to pick on Mary a little bit. Uh, it's, it's, it's always entertaining when you, you're standing on the curb for a couple hours and, uh, <laughs> with your bags, and, uh, and then you decide, maybe I should call. <laughs> and they go, oh, you're here? <laughs> It was really pretty fun, but uh, but I do want to thank I want to thank Mary and everybody that has something to do with this. And I'm being very serious for a second. You know, somebody set up these chairs, somebody made the coffee, somebody brought these be- uh, lovely flowers that flowers, and people have been working on this for a long time. I was so arrogant when I got here. I thought maybe they just came Friday morning to these conventions and said, "Okay, what should we do?" It would have never dawned on me that you met hour after hour after hour. I knew that you were doing all the special things for me, but I didn't know how long it took to get them done. So I am grateful for that. I want you to know that I'm aware that I'm a very small part of a really big deal, A-A-L-A. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, I'm supposed to tell you in a general way what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. You know, who is it, Patio, that says, if I'd known I was going to get to tell this, I'd have paid better attention (laughs) to how it was. Because a lot of this stuff is possibly hearsay, and a lot of the stuff I'm going to tell you today, I wish I was making up. But it's really true about growing up in alcoholism. That's That was my case. I know I'm not unique in this room. But I want to tell you that my first memory, literally in my home, was catching my mom and dad in the kitchen early one morning. Don't get ahead of me. Um, and, um, and she literally has my dad's face or uh, head in her hands, and she said, Ray, I want you to go to work. And then she'd yank him around, and she'd say, and then I want you to come home. Go to work. Come home. Now, that might be kind of funny or crazy to you, but my first thought is I believe my daddy's retarded. (laughs) I don't even use that word anymore, but the truth is is that, you know, I'm 10, 11 years old, and I went, oh, my gosh. What adult would need somebody to tell them, go to work, come home? And then I began to review in my head that my daddy could go to work. In fact, my daddy, who was alcoholic, went to work when he probably should not have based on the night before or what he was doing probably that morning. But my daddy could go to work. But I tell you what, coming home was kind of a challenge for the old boy. Um, And I want to tell you why. He believed, you've heard this expression, he believed to his innermost self that because he worked hard and provided for his family, which, by the way, he did, He believed with all his heart that he could go to work and then he could stop by the local on the way home and uh, and have a couple of beers. He believed he deserved that. And what I know today, only after being with you, is that he actually believed he could do that. Because see, back then, there wasn't a reality show on every 10 minutes talking about alcoholism, interventions and stuff, you know. Okay, I'll tell you. I said it yesterday. I'm between 39 and a Walmart greeter, and that's as close as you're going to get my age. So my sponsor says. But back then, when I said back then, some of the young people were going. Okay. Anyway, we really didn't talk about alcoholism. I, not only had I not seen social drinking, But we didn't talk about alcoholism. I knew my dad was a pathetic second-class citizen drunk. I'm going to get to hear more about that. But But the truth is, is that what he didn't know, absolutely did not know, is that when he stopped at the at the bar, and he took one drink, the phenomenon of craving was going to happen. It wasn't maybe. It wasn't sometimes. We didn't know about that. I just thought he was pathetic. And so I've got that 
that going on over here, my daddy thinking, okay, I'm going to have a couple beers and come home. We're going to sit down and have that good dinner. But over here in the kitchen, my mother would work hard all day and she'd come and come home and she would begin to uh, cook dinner. And in her mind, it's getting close to five o'clock. Well, everybody knows at five o'clock you sit down with your family and you have dinner. You know, you'd ask each other about how their day was. Now, it's never happened in our home at this point. But she believes to her innermost self that she can create the environment for that to happen. And how do I know that? How do I know I grew up in alcoholism? It's because my dad's stopping because he believes he can control his drinking and come home. And my mother believes some things that she could do to make that happen. And they both, uh, that doesn't meet up in the kitchen, by the way. And so, so what would happen is literally, uh, there's, I, I, I refer sometimes to pure al -Anons. That's somebody that's not in any other program. And boy, a, a, a pure al I, I know today has this 27th sense, okay, of, you know, they, she would be cooking, but I know she was listening for those tires, and they can tell, they, they don't get them mixed up with anybody else's tires, but they're going to come rolling in when it's time, and we're going to sit down and have dinner. But also, mama, I, got, I, I better add, my mother was not an Al-Anon. People who are drunks are not AAs. An Al-Anon is somebody who has a sponsor and goes to meetings and prays on their knees and takes commitments and does them. Those, those that things that you, the people in this room know, that's an alanot. My mother was an alligator, okay? <laughs> My friend Ellen taught me that. Well, think about it. They're kind of snappy, yeah. You never know when they're going to snap. <laughs> kind of prickly on the back. And you know what? And more importantly, they're good trackers. Good track. So, so that's what I grew up with. My mother was an alligator. And uh, here's what that looks like. She would be listening for those tires that are not coming. It, the clock would be ticking closer to 5 o'clock. And, uh, and when it would strike 5 o'clock, her whole personality changed. <laughs> and um, she became an alligator. And that means she would literally it'd go to the phone and begin to dial those numbers. Now, the list of numbers she's dialing is beside the phone, but it doesn't say CVS or pediatrician. It's Bloody Bucket, Joe's Bar and Grill. I mean, it's all the bars in the city of Pasadena. So, Texas. Uh, I know it's hard to tell I am from Texas, but... Um, but anyway, she'd start calling those. And you got to stay pretty close with me now because from, from this point on, it goes kind of downhill. Um, she would say things like, Ray Burkhalter there, and they would say, nope. And she'd call the next one, Ray Burkhalter there, nope. We'd go through the whole list. Now we know where he isn't, but that doesn't get an alligator down, because she'd turn around, to me and my brother, both, whatever, and she'd say, get in the car, because we are going to get him, okay? <laughs> so it's funny today, but some of you know exactly what I'm saying. It's, you know... Um, I don't want to go get him. Apparently, we don't like him. So, um, <laughs> um, but we're going to go get him and bring him home so we can sit down and have the good dinner at 5 o'clock. And I was going, to, I tell you what, when I saw on the program we were having dinner at 5 o'clock last night, I just began to sweat. I just, <laughs> I'm telling you, whew, you'll notice I got here at 5.10. <laughs> but, so here's that boy, we're in, we're in motion and we're going to go and we get in the car. And I swear there's only about five choices, but I tell you them trackers, we'd find that old boy the first time at the first shot. Most of the time, even though we parked around back where your truck becomes invisible. So, um, yeah, like some of you didn't do that. Okay. So, but you send the kids in. Yeah. You know, and I'd go in that smoky, awful bar and I'd say, mama, I want you to come home. Here's what I know. I humiliated my daddy one day at a time. I know that. I couldn't have known it. We didn't know about alcoholism. 
He'd send us back out and he'd say, tell your mama to take you on, blah, blah, blah. It never was the right answer. But eventually my daddy would, would come out to the parking lot and my mother would look at me or my brother or both and she'd say, I want you to ride home with your daddy. Now you think about that. My mother would not have put me in harm's way. But what did she know? Just like my daddy knew that when he took that drink, he was going to get a sense of ease and comfort. My mama knew if I was in his truck, he would come home. That was really the goal all along. We're going to get him home and we're going to solve uh, this age old problem that seems to happen day in and day out because she believed that. How do I know that? Because well, I'd ride home. Sometimes it was a pretty interesting ride. Um, but we'd get home and we'd sit down at the table and I was always the one that would go, forget and I'd turn around and I'd say, Daddy, do you think, and ooh, those alligator eyes would come around and she'd say, no, don't you talk to him. Now let's review. Um, <laughs> I just came home from school. You know, I think that we're actually going to maybe hit eat hot food. And... Uh, but no, boy, when, when alcoholism goes into motion, my daddy's not home. We call, we find out where he isn't. That's what they said. But we're going to go get him where he isn't, bring him home so we can not talk to him. I can't wait to get married at this point. <laughs> Did it happen every day? I don't know. I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, I have the least desire to exaggerate it. But you know when you're a kid, feels like every day. And you know what I know today also that's not as funny is that alcoholism doesn't leave anybody out. It never leaves anybody out. And I don't really know where I am at Burbank. Um, there's somebody that, that today will say, I'm not going to drink. I'm serious. I'm not going to drink. There's somebody today deciding whether they're going to stay. Can I stay one more day or do I need to leave? And I promise you there's a kid in the closet somewhere waiting to see if it's safe to come out because alcoholism doesn't leave anybody out. So that's what it felt like. I know that's not funny, but I have some great news I'm going to get to share with you today. Some absolute great news and I got to get busy. Okay, here's the thing. I asked my mother one time why we did that. Why did we go get him, bring him home? Blah, blah. And she looked at me, my friends, with the sincerity of a, um, a parent teaching their children any principle to live by. And she said, oh, if we don't go get him, he will not know we're mad at him. I said, I could live with that. But anyway, <laughs> now she's serious. He won't know. We can't let him be over there not knowing we're really mad. Okay, And she said if we talk to him when he gets home, he will not know he's being punished. Now, you know what? He believes to his innermost self he can drink. She believes to her innermost self that she can control alcoholism. That's why we're all here. That's, that's, you know, alcoholism is ugly. It doesn't give you any warning. It is never kind. It involves everybody. But I know today that those parents that I began to develop a hatred for that was palpable. I hated those people. I thought, I used to tell people I was adopted. I could not be from these people. And I wanted to believe that. I thought, oh, because I learned the lesson well. I hated him for being so weak and pathetic because he could not, not drink. And I hated her because it seemed fair and she always wanted to go get him. I mean, just crazy things in your mind that are, that are creating the ideas that you can make it different. If I'd been a better kid. Because see, I do know that alcoholism tears us down. Absolutely. You hear it. You hear, I am not enough in every room you go in. And that's the truth. It did tear me down. And I knew somehow I'd never be enough because if I was enough, my daddy would have come home. We wouldn't have to go get him day in and day out. But the truth is, for this, this gal, when I was in my house, whether it's my mama's house or my first apartment or the first home I opened, I owned, I, inside there, I knew I would never be enough. And I better start developing a real talent for showing you who I'm going to be someday. 
I knew I wasn't enough to show you who I was this day. So I began to take that on. And when I'd walk out just the threshold of any one of those houses, I became bulletproof. You would have never known in a million years that I lived in pain or the, just the chaos of alcoholism. And that's from when I was a kid, and I brought that way, way into the program, if I'm really being honest today. Just that, you know, I'm not going to get close to another human being. Are you kidding? I don't want to go find you. I don't want to feed you when you get home. Okay, I don't want to punish you. I don't want to get it right so we can not have alcoholism anymore. And so I tell you what, the sad part about that is I did that well into my adulthood. You could you could take me to dinner. You could buy me flowers, but you're not I'm not no. You will not get in my space and I, the sad news about that is you can do it. You can absolutely do that. You can cut off your heart and your mind to any possibility of relating with another human being. And I did that. But now, okay, all that stupid alcoholism stuff is going on in Pasadena in my house. But I'm going to go to college and become rich and famous, so I'll never have to look at that, right? Okay, I, I, I uh, majored in education, so uh, I'm possibly not ever going to be rich and famous. But... The, <laughs> probably the only mistake I ever made. By, oh, I did forget to tell you, by age 10, I truly am the smartest person I know. And, uh, and I got really good at that. I wish there was a way to actually explain to you the desperation in that. I was terrified from a kid that you were going to figure out something I didn't know. I didn't even know what I didn't know that you were going to figure out that I didn't know. I mean, I couldn't identify any of that. I just knew that I had to appear to be much superior intellectually, had to appear to have more money than I had or whatever. I could probably convince you I'm taller right now if you'd give me a little more time, but no, not Richard. So, do you know what I'm saying? I mean, I got good at it. You, you literally, I was picture perfect at what I was going to be someday. So I, I, you know, I'm not having a great time, but I went to college, of course I did. I'm already very, very intelligent, and so maybe I didn't need college, but I wanted the piece of paper to prove my brilliance. So I went to, I went to uh, college, and let me tell you, thank goodness I got there on time. This is going to make some of you al cry. Okay. I'm over here, and I get to college, and you sort of, by default, begin to form some friendships. You know what I mean? I, I, didn't ha I don't remember any high school friends. I didn't learn how to be a friend among friends or a worker among workers in my alcoholism. But I'm developing some relationships, and I'll never forget, I heard somebody say that they were going to go out that night, which meant they would go and have a few drinks, play pool, whatever. And my absolute honest-to-God gut-level thought was, well, thank goodness I got here on time because i got to save these people. And with a clear conscience, this is what I did. I would. I, I, be, I was a college athlete, and so it would be some of the athletes, and I'd go, you know what, the only people who can go tonight are the ones that fit in my car. Now, they did it, so clearly I don't owe any amends, okay? Because they would, they would fall for it. They would just start packing in, and you know how we used to do. We just pack as many people as we can get in the car. And, uh, and as, as luck would have it, I'm the designated everything. <laughs> um, I was the designator. And so, uh, you know, I was the safe driver because I'm not going to drink. Duh. My mama taught me drinking's bad. People who drink are very bad and they must be punished. And somehow, if you ever get it right, they'll never take another drink. And I begin to care about these people. And so I'd be like on the way to the bar and I'd go, okay, how many are you going to drink? We know two. And I I was clear. I'm a teacher. I was crystal clear about the rules. Absolutely. What time are you going to be back at the car? I had it. I mean, now I know I should have had handouts. But the truth is, <laughs> the truth is, is that I was clear about the rules. And this is the part that will really get to you. We'd get to the bar and they would spread out on me. Now, some of you only had one to watch. I would be like, oh, okay. But I want you to know that I did the best I could. 
I am on guard. But let me tell you what would happen. Some of those people, when I was watching somebody else, would take the ninth drink, the tenth drink, and they just pass out like they always did. It was so embarrassing. Their behavior was embarrassing to me. And then there were people who went home with people they did not know. Yes. Slut, slut, slut. <laughs> friends, 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 friends. But I did the best I could every time of getting them back into the car. And, uh, and this is the part that makes my heart go up today. We'd get back on campus and the athletic dorms were right across, right in the middle of campus. And, and they had metal stairs. And I would do, you know, I think, well, I got to get them all home. So I would literally get them out of the car and help them halfway up the stairs. Yeah. <laughs> and let go. Now let me, hey, now this is what that sounds like. I'm telling you, that whether you like it or not, kind of gives you a little rush when you think about, <laughs> about some of those things you used to do. So anyway, I would do that. And guess what? It's kind of a crazy story here. This is parts I wish I was making up. I did that to these people for four years and looking them straight in the eye and saying, you don't have a chance if you keep going down this road. And I don't even know if they were alcoholic. Never seen social drinking. But the truth is, is that I was literally sincere. I'd go, you can't do it. If you, people who drink are bad. And they should be punished. And I had all kinds. And I really thought, somebody looked me in the eye just like I did my mom and said, you know, if you're really going to help, what's the point of letting go halfway up? I thought, oh, boy, I'll do the best I can to teach you. And I did that. So now you see that I'm, all, I'm already showing you who I'm going to be. And I'm already full blown into the absolute desperation of controlling somebody else so that I can be okay. And I was sincere about that, and I did it, and I did it, and I did it. I graduated from college. Of course I did. And uh, I taught for a semester. Oh, I was lonely. I was lonely because, you know, at least I'd had the college environment, and I'm out on my own, and, man, I'm locking that door at night to that beautiful apartment and, and driving a new car. My daddy paid for it, but don't forget he ruined my whole life. Okay, <laughs> let's not forget that part. So the truth is, is that now I'm locking the door and the only person's home is me and I don't like who's home. See, I'm one of those people, I think somebody said it already, one of the speakers, we have great speakers this weekend already. That's, you know, when I got there, I was there. I kept thinking I'm going to get to some event that's going to make it different. I'm going to be somebody different. But every time I moved here, 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 and here, and here, only to change the course of America, I mean, American education. I had to believe stuff like that. I had to believe you were going to move so I could teach your children because otherwise I'm not enough. So that's now I've taken that into life and I'm controlling every situation. I got a call to go get my master's degree. Of course I did. I got my master's degree in nine months, made all A's, if you might want to jot that down. You know. <laughs> I thought, I thought people were going to stop me on the street going, oh, my God, is it you? But Because uh, i got to believe that. i got to believe that. I've got even more pieces of paper. And let me just tell you something. I don't know why this is coming up. I've got, you know, they, I've got other degrees. And I know that somewhere in the garage, in a box, those are all framed nice and pretty. I know they are somewhere. I don't know where, but I can tell you where my last medallion is that you handed me. I know exactly where it is, and you can't have it. Because it's precious to me as a reminder that you, you can't punish them enough, and you can't punish them right to solve the problem of alcoholism. I hope if you're new, you just somehow know that the solution will never be out there. It will only be in here. And that it makes sense it makes sense. I was at a workshop right before this, and someone spoke that had a year. I almost asked her to be my sponsor. The wonder, the hope that this young lady was expressing. I thought, boy, that's why I come back. 
I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of the solution today. And so what I know is if I'm not a part of the problem, I can't be a part of the solution. It's called minding your own business. But the truth is, is that I'm doing that day and I I went to graduate school. I did well. I came home. You know what? I, I, I need to tell you, I don't even remember being there much. Went to Michigan, caused a few car accidents because I'd never seen snow. Apparently, when people see you do this, they run into each other while they're watching you. So I was, I was able on two occasions to call, cause car accidents and be in neither car. So it felt like power to me. You know, I thought that's, I, I have such a belief at this point in my life that I can control me and you. How many of you have ever thought, if you just listen to me, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to go slow. You know, so that's the kind of things that I, oh, by the way, I'm not avoiding talking about relationships. I don't have any. I don't have any. The reason I think I adopted uh, uh, Dana's expression about I stopped doing drive-by Al-Anon in 86 is because every relationship I'd been in was a drive-by experience. And I know there's somebody else that used to say wine to somebody. I just wish I could find somebody emotionally available. Well, it wasn't here. It, well, I was not emotionally available. <laughs> Unless maybe emotional available is that I, you, you pick up one of my life plan booklets <laughs> and do what I ask you to do so that we can be happy. I don't know how to be in relationships all the way up until I did. I, 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 uh, I fell in love. I was in Austin, Texas. I fell in love. And trust me, I didn't mean to. I do not want to be in love. I don't want, to, uh, want another person in my life, but I did that. And I killed that relationship. I absolutely killed that relationship. My sponsor said to me one time, uh, I wish I could have heard it when I, the first time, but told me to get my hands and and just to run water in my hands like this under a, a water spigot. And he said, I want you to hold on to that water as long as you can. And you know what I did? I mean, I went, oh, hold on to it. Ah. Because if you try to hold on to it, it's gone. But if you keep your hands gently closed together and you give the water space to live, you can hold water for kind of a long time. I didn't, I didn't get that. I tell you what I did. I was 12 step to go to a treatment for my disease of alanonism. And I did that. I'm going to talk a lot about that. But I'm telling you, one of the things that, that that did for me is that you didn't, you couldn't leave without a sponsor. And you couldn't leave the, the hospital without the, knowing what home group you were going to go to. Just having a well-established plan. Now, I met about this time, uh, Two people called Linda and Dennis Lamphere. He was AA and she was an al And I wanted everything they had. I wanted, every, and I didn't know how to think that way because, you know, when you are brilliant, it's tough in the world. It's tough in the world. But I began to work with them like my life depended on it. And if you're new, I want to tell you that I did that because my life depended on it. You know, they can't autopsy. When, when, a, when a drunk, gets autopsied or in, in a situation, people may come out and say, man, you know, this guy didn't, or this woman didn't have much longer to live anyway. Her liver, blah, blah, blah. But I got to tell you, when I'm driving across town like a maniac in the middle of the night just to see if somebody else's car is in the driveway, and I can't tell you how I got there or how I got home, if I'd had been killed in a car accident that night in the autopsy, they can't see the rage and the control and the need and the not enoughness. They'll never come out and tell your family about that. But we know it's there. So anyway, I start going to meet. Well, you know what? I was still not. I, this is all I'm going to say. I was already in, in, in some 12-step recovery. But at the time, I'm coming late. I'm leaving early for a while for a while and then waiting for you to make me feel better. I could be driving home going, I don't think they even care about me. You would have had to chase me to say hello. And I was a liar. I mean, they'd say, well, go to lunch with us. I said, I sure would, but I'm going out of town. 
remember how brilliant I am? I couldn't even think of an, I'm going out of town. I'm going out of town. I was like a pull toy. Because I, I'm just like, hoo, hoo. Because I don't know how to sit across from you and talk. I don't know how to do that. But I got taught how to do that because I want to tell you the good news. I, I just wanted to give you a real clear picture of what I brought you to work with. Okay? You could see my, my arrogance entered the room before me. But, lest I forget, it's arrogance based on absolute terror. That you're going to find out that something I don't know. Something I can't do. Or you're going to see through all that facade and see who I was that day instead of, wait, stick with me because someday I'm going to be something. So anyway, so, you know, and I don't know what about your sponsor because I'm going to tell you a little bit about my foundation, but I still have sponsorship like that today. In other words, I actually have people in my life and have always had people in my life who expect me to act better than I feel all the time. I mean, like work the program all the time. And I tell you what, I couldn't, I mean, I've been to graduate school, but I thought, good grief, they should not even take spring break. <laughs> and I'm great, I have that today, but let me tell you about these two people, so you'll like me a little bit more. This is an example. This is an example. Oh, I just had a public al slip on tape. Anyway, I'm, I'm back. Um, I call one time to, to turn somebody in. Now, now, picture this. You're at work and somebody does something really wrong. It's hard. And so, now I'm long distance with my, my sponsor who has never met this person in her life, but I cannot wait to get home to turn them in. Because we got to solve this problem. Because somebody was really wrong. And if you're not careful when somebody's wrong, you become righter by the second. Okay? And so I turned them in. And I'm just going, oh, oh, I'm glad you're home. Blah, 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 blah. And I knew that how much they cared about me when I would be so uptight when I'd call. Because I'd hear this. Pick up the extension. It takes a village. So... <laughs> I get both of them on the phone and I'm going, and let me tell you, and blah, blah, and I'll never forget one of the two of them said, whew, it sounds like this is important. And I went, I'm talking. And, uh, <laughs> and he said, he or she said, well, I got to tell you, I need to get some coffee. And I said, okay, well, I'll wait. And he said, oh no, you go ahead. <laughs> if I go ahead, you won't hear because this is what I want to tell you when I start telling you about the good news. I have somebody in my life that loves me that much. His next sentence wasn't sarcastic. He, he knew how to get my complete attention. But the truth was that he said, as soon as I get back, we're going to get to the exact nature of the wrong, and then we'll move into the solution. Wow. Wow, I was brilliant, knew just about everything about everything. And that just, I went, where do you get this stuff? Wasn't the first time I heard it. It was the first time I felt it. Yeah, first time. And so some things began to happen. Yes, I started getting there 30 minutes early. Yes, I took some commitments. Yes, I met people who were coming in. And I was able to open my arms and say, come on in. Sit all the way down. Because, see, I'm not a drive-by Al-Anon anymore. I came and you give, gave me everything you have. I, I got it, and I left. I didn't need you anymore. I had, what I, ne I had what I needed. It would have never dawned on me then to stay and give it back to somebody else. It would have never dawned on me. But in 86, I sat all the way down in that chair, and I tell you, it feels different from that vantage point. And you gave me everything you have, and I hope that I, hope I get to go to an Al-Anon meeting right before my funeral. I do. I hope that that's a possibility for me. But one day I called, and, and this is going to tell you, I told you who I am. That's what happened. I made every mistake. I'm still trying to control everything that, that I could in my life. And then I got to Al-Anon, and I began to listen, and I began to take actions instead of just activity. And so I called one day, and I said, you know, I'm doing everything you ask. And it was not the best time to call your sponsor. Because the next word out of my, next phrase out of my mouth was, so what am I going to get? What am I going 
going to get? And I'm ready for the, oh my gosh. I, one more time. You're No, but they always trick you. <laughs> he said, oh, precious. I'm so glad you asked. I've been wanting to tell you. I have some promises for you, my sweet. And I don't know if I said it out loud. I probably did. You mean like on page 83 and 84? So he'd know that I did, you know. And he said, he said, oh, no, precious. I have some special promises for you. I was like, oh, my God. Do you want me to get something to write on? He said, well, let me just share them. It was both of them on the phone, to be honest with you. And I said, what? He said, I, I promise you, my friend, that if you'll go to meetings, somebody like you, like a lot of them, you're going to meet people whose insides feel just like yours, even though their outsides or circumstances may be completely different. Boy, I went, whoa. See, I didn't want to keep looking at what kind of car you drove or where you lived, but I was. And guess what? I will not, under any possibility, be the same after being with you this morning. Can't be. Can't be. I could, if I'd had time to tell you some truths or some concerns or some joys in my life, I know two things are going to happen. You're going to care. And if it's a concern, you're going to remember me. I believe that. I know. Because I have to give God the ABCs every night because I can't remember all the people I'm praying for. And I give him the ABCs and he fills it all in and he doesn't ever forget anybody. So guess what? That describes my life today. What's it like today? I go to a lot of meetings because I want to feel, oh, I got to do something in one minute. Okay, because I want to feel the way I feel after I've gone to a meeting. Guess what? I, I was promised that if I'd study the literature, any problem I had, any problem I caused, answers right there. True story. Absolutely. I was promised that if uh, these two things will just blow your socks off. I was promised that if I would work the steps with a sponsor... I could become anybody I wanted to be. Now, remember, I'm acting like I think I'm precious. I'm acting like I'm enough, but I know for sure. I'm locking the door, remember, and I don't like who's home. And you're telling me if I work these steps, I can become anybody I want to be. Guess what? It has come true, and it continues to come true because there's the steps of this program are the only things that help an adult like me. Stop doing what I should never have been doing and start doing what I should. Nothing, nothing. All those life plans, nothing. But I, and guess what? Every conversation I have with my sponsor and every conversation I have with my sponsees, I'm telling you, we're in the steps. We're in the steps. You can't not be because that's the life you've given me. Okay, he promised me, they promised me, that God would always be big enough. Whew. And if I ever wondered about that, look at who the judge is. Look at who the judge is. Well, let me tell you, let me prove that for you. Remember those parents that, that I hated so much? I didn't have time to tell you. that I could t tell you countless stories about how disrespectful I treated them. I said things to them that no one should say to anybody. I treated them like second-class citizens. I'm not proud of that. I didn't have any trouble taking the keys to a new car. I never had trouble putting their money in my bank. But guess where? I didn't tell that part of the story when I got to you. I just wanted you to know how bad it had been. Well, let me tell you something. This is proof perfect that the God of your understanding can, is bigger, will always be big enough. My daddy got really, really sick, okay? He got really, really sick, and he... Uh, and I didn't know what to do. I was like, oh, my God. And I called my sponsor, and I said, you know, I'd, I'd started doing some things I should, and I'd stopped doing some things I shouldn't. But, uh, but I got told by my own non-sponsor to, to touch him. And you want to go, is there anybody else on the line? I mean, touch him. I said, because I was desperate. I don't know what to do. They told us today they can't help him. And I touched him. I grabbed his foot. It's the best I could do. Then the next day, they want you to do it again. And then before you know it, they're asking you to do things like, why don't you touch him and tell him that you love him? I'll never forget. I will never forget the moment. 
when I finally said it, and then they want you to do it again and again and again. Now, that was May of 1988, and on December the 25th at, not, at 4.30 in the afternoon, 1988, my daddy went home. And the last words we spoke to each other were, I love you more than you ever know. That's a true statement, but i got to tell you something, because I treated him like my father. I treated him like a sick alcoholic. You don't ask me where I've been. Nobody's asked me when I got to AA, LA. Well, what, tell us what you did first. And I treated him that way. Then I got 12 more years to do that with my mama. All of a sudden they said, well, are you hugging your mama? Are you telling her that you love her? And I went, she ain't sick. I mean, oh, isn't that good? I think God makes me say that because left to my own devices, that's how I think. I do not know how to think of you more than me. I don't know how. I got to have you remind me. I got to have you remind me. So let me tell you about this. Um, you know, I started just just trying to be the person I should be with my mom. And she, she, when she'd tell me to hug her, my mother was, anybody else got a, a hug uh, from your parents? It's like this podium. <laughs> And guess what I do? I go, <laughs> why do I have to do it? And today you could ask me to do anything because I would know that the answer is because. Because, because let me tell you something. My mama lived on a lake in Conroe, Texas, and I remember the color of the chair that she got out of to assume hug position. I'll never forget it. And she didn't let go. She's never been to a meeting. I had. Small differences. I mean, uh, small changes make huge differences, my friend. Just do what they ask you to do. And let me tell you something. In May of 2000, she called me and said, they tell me I cannot, I cannot live anymore. With I can't live alone anymore. And I bought this house, I promise. I bought this house and I brought my mama to live with me. And I want you to know one day at a time, she could have asked me to cut the grass with scissors. And it's all your fault. She didn't change. She didn't change, but I would have done it. I combed her hair. I, I did things for her that I, then I took her to the beauty shop because I'd combed her hair. But anyway, um, <laughs> seriously, I would do things that are not me. She wanted her nails done one time and I did them. I didn't know that, that on that Sunday when I'm doing her nails, both of us shaking, that she was going to go home on Tuesday. I didn't know that I would be leaving, walking out of the hospital room never to speak to her face to face again. I couldn't have known that. But let me tell you what you made me do. You might as well have been there. You made me crawl up in the bed before I was leaving. Oh, by the way, I was coming to a commitment, and that's why she kept shoving me out the door. She knew what you taught me about commitment. I said, I don't want to go, Mama. And she said, you have a commitment. I'll call you a sponsor. I mean, you know. So... <laughs> I'm up in the bed and I realize that you have to be real careful if you think, if you begin to believe that God is big enough because you'll forget to remember real important things like I was rocking her and I used to whine about wondering if she ever rocked me and I'm rocking my mama and I begin to forget about what happened in 1966 and who didn't come here or what money she didn't give I, I, you'll forget to remember. And let me tell you why. Because then I said to her, Mama, do you want me to put you in the chair? Because I know I have to go. i got to get on an airplane. And I put my mama in a chair and I knelt before her. You taught me that the definition of humility is the ability to stand up and the, and the willingness to kneel down. And I looked at her and said, have I told you today how glad I am that you're my mama? She said, yeah. Now, when I got off an airplane that night, they put a phone to her ear because she was going home. No one finished business. Are you kidding me? From who, 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 what I brought you? That describes my life today because you can come in my home and you're going to be treated with respect. And I got to give my parents that which they deserved. And the last promises that I'll end with is that, you know, they'd say, Nancy, just give away a little bit. When Richard calls, say, oh, what a privilege. Thank you. I'd, I, I'd be glad to come. Just give away a little bit, and you will get back tenfold. And all you got to do is look around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>